So we're going to get started a few minutes early. So good morning, everybody. Good morning. That's not loud enough. I don't uh, know. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. I was an education major at one point, so <laughs> it's just in my nature. Uh, so good morning, everybody. Welcome to the University of Indianapolis. Uh, my name is Olivia Chris, and we are so honored to have you guys here for the in in Indiana um, Association of School Broadcasters. Uh, annual conference and we're super excited to have Chris Bengel here as well he's going to teach you guys a little bit about podcasting um, so Chris is the digital director for the number one talk show in America for the Bob and Tom show which is broadcast right here in Indianapolis on uh, Q95 so definitely check in and listen um, he also in his free time is a freelance podcast host uh, he also does consulting and a producer for that as well. So he's very busy, as well as a weekly radio show on iHeartRadio called Now Hear This. And now you're going to hear from Chris. So Chris, take it away. Thank you so much. Thanks, thanks so much for attending and choosing me over Brad Shoemaker. Uh, he messaged me earlier in the week, and so if you're going to Brad's, we coordinate it so you won't hear the same thing. So if you're going to the other podcast, uh, I, I actually worked for Brad in 2009 when he was producing podcasts. So I've been a podcaster since 2007, so I've done this since most of you were in grade school, which is a weird feeling. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about my career path, just to give you uh, an idea of where I started from and how I got to where I'm at. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about what makes a successful podcast. How many of you have a podcast or are podcasting? All right, a good number of you. Uh, and I'm going to leave some time, let me start my timer, to make sure that we have some Q&A afterwards. So if there's anything that you want to know that I don't cover, uh, and I'm recording this too, so it'll be available. Just check out my social media, it'll, it'll be somewhere. Um, so, I wanted to get into talk radio uh, as a kid. I remember sitting on my front lawn on Halloween night at eight years old listening to War of the Worlds by Orson Welles. Do any of you know what that is? Yeah. All right, that's like a famous radio play that Orson Welles put together. And it was terrifying to the entire nation. It was the coronavirus of like 1939. <laughs> and people were listening to this thinking that aliens were invading. And I was listening to it 75 years later getting goosebumps. I'm getting goosebumps thinking about it now because it was so powerful. And while it wasn't this sophisticated of a thought, I just thought if this medium can make me feel this thing this far away from the original production of it, I want to be a part of that. Uh, I also got a talk boy around the same time from Home Alone, the little gray talk boy, and that I think was uh, the beginning of my podcasting and radio career. And uh, I just decided that that was going to be my career path. I wanted to do talk radio. I loved listening to Rush with my grandma and uh, started just working towards that. And I went to college at IUPUI trying to make that my career path. I was always interested in politics. And in 2004, I got an internship at WXNT, 1430 AM, which at the time was the lowest rated AM station in Indianapolis. It was bottom of the barrel, but I couldn't have been any happier to, to work there. And I went to my boss um, in 2000 and turning off notifications, uh, 2007, 2006, I think, and I said, hey, there's this thing called podcasting, and it just got introduced into iTunes. So in 2005, the first podcaster was Adam Curry. He just was on Ro Joe Rogan last week, if you want to go hear the history of podcasting. And he worked with Apple and Steve Jobs to put podcasting into their new iTunes product when the iPod came out. And that completely changed it introduced a brand new industry because Apple gave it that lift. And so I went to my boss and I said, we should start podcasting Abdul's show. Any of you go, if any of you go to U of I, you may have Abdul Hakim Shabazz, who's one of my mentors and uh, the, the person that I worked with for four years and a great friend of mine. And the boss said, why would we ever want to compete with ourselves? I said, okay. <laughs> And that was the attitude towards podcasting until about two years ago in radio. Uh, that podcasting was a competitor to radio and we don't want to hurt ourselves. Now, 
uh, we're connected to Westwood One, they're begging us to do podcasts because it's like, they see the potential and the growth and the audience <coughs> lift that you get from podcasting, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, so I worked at WXNT for four years. I eventually became the morning show producer. Really enjoyed doing that. Uh, we did start podcasting the show in 2007, and that was the beginning of my podcast. We, we didn't even have uh, the, we didn't even have an RSS feed. I don't know totally at that point because the technology was so backwards. It's so easy compared to now. Personally, I started a blog on in 2007. And that was one of the best decisions I ever made, and that's what I'm going to continually encourage you to do through the talk, is to build your own thing. Because the ability to learn on my own platform that I've been building since 2007 has made me a better candidate for future work. And I was fortunate enough to get an internship in 2004. The reality in broadcasting is that internships are harder and harder to come by. Brief history, some Hollywood interns were getting coffee. It's like a classic meme that interns just get coffee. So they sued the Hollywood studio. And so they won, and the federal government passed some rules that said you have to give interns credit, you have to pay them, and they have to do something substantial towards their education. They're not free labor. And so what, what happened? Most companies couldn't afford to hire interns and pay them, so they just stopped doing internships. So. Podcasting, blogging, YouTubing, video vlogging, I hate the term blogging, that's why I said YouTubing. Um, that becomes even more important for all of you who want to work in broadcast media. Because if you can build your own thing, it makes you, it gives you the experience that will be marketable to future employees because internships may be harder to find once you are ready to leave college. But if you have years of building your own audience around your own thing, even if it's a small audience, they'll go, wow, this person has digital skills. That's what happened in my case. That eight-year-old boy sitting on the front lawn said, I want to work for Bob and Tom someday. And I do. And it's because I started my own thing and built those skills. And when I finally got the chance to meet Tom, he said, wow, you have all the skills I've been looking for to improve this section of our business. And so, uh, I left the radio station to go work for the Libertarian Party of Indiana, and I worked there for four years because I recognized that I didn't know much about how politics actually worked, and if I wanted to be a talk radio show host, I probably should have some understanding of politics. And I listened to some of those old shows in 2007 and 8, and I'm so embarrassing. <laughs> um, and while there, I started a college outreach podcast called We Are Libertarians. And that the eighth anniversary of that show that I continued to do was yesterday. Uh, and that has turned into a podcast that's got 3.6 million downloads. We've had 50 or 60 people involved, half a dozen shows on the network currently, probably 15 over time, a blog, a magazine. Uh, that has turned into sort of my main driver of what I do and where I've built my skills. I've built my own thing and grew We Are Libertarians into a podcast that gets about 10,000 downloads per episode. And I've been able to help lift um, other people inside my niche uh, through the size of that particular audience. And uh, let me go back. So. We Are Libertarians is a conversational show amongst friends. It sounds like you're listening to people sitting around a kitchen table talking about politics, and that's what we want. We want to inform you about the news from a libertarian perspective in a fun and, and engaging way. And that has uh, been the bulk of my social circle. Uh, it has been just a tremendous uh, blessing in my life because I've got so many friends from doing this podcast, and that's another great benefit of doing a podcast is all the people that you work on this project with. So I left the Libertarian Party to go work at a local ad agency. And while there, we needed to redesign a logo. And I ended up meeting the graphic designer for Bob and Tom. Now what I didn't know when I met PJ was that Bob and Tom had been looking for somebody to fill the role that I'm in now for three years. They just didn't know who to hire at the time. Uh, and they really needed to evolve their, their digital presence. So when I met Tom and I sat down with him, 
He goes, wait a minute, you work at an ad agency, you were in radio, you know organization because of the, the, uh, the political stuff, you have your own podcast, you understand social media, you know how to run a website, this is a no-brainer. Uh, and so I credit podcasting and running my own website and building my own network uh, with getting me the opportunity to have such an amazing job. Uh, at Bob and Tom, I have, I counted the other day, I've uploaded 16,000 podcasts in the last six and a half years. Uh, I've all told probably uploaded about 18,000. Um, at this point, um, I've done probably 10,000 hours of podcasting. I'm uh, responsible for about 10 million downloads between Bob and Tom and my own podcast at this point. And it didn't feel like it was significant until you sit back 15 years into it and go, whoa, okay, I've done a lot of stuff. And while at Bob and Tom, I met a comedian named Miss Pat. She is the funniest person on the planet. Uh, you will one day know her name if you don't already know Miss Pat's name. And I'm now on a comedy podcast. And that comedy podcast has 70,000 downloads a week. And when Miss Pat wanted to start a podcast, she said, it's a no-brainer should be on the show and you should help me build this thing and so we've been building a podcast there over the last year and when another friend Robert Vane wanted to start a podcast called Leaders and Legends to promote his business he said it's a no-brainer you understand podcasting and when he asks questions it's like stuff I can do in my sleep and so I now work as a podcast consultant uh, in this growing industry four years ago I had to have something on my website that explained how to download a podcast my dad did not know what a podcast was. A year ago, he called me and he goes, I listened to my first podcast. It was the Dale Jr. podcast. I said, thanks for the support, Dad. Um, but that shows you that you know, my boomer dad, who doesn't understand technology at all, is listening to podcasts now. The entire industry, Brad Shoemaker and I were talking about this the other day, because Brad and I talked in 2013 about starting a podcast studio together. He started his own podcast studio, which I'm sure he will talk about. And people just didn't understand what it was. They didn't understand how to do it. And so if you have to explain your product, it's very hard to build a business around that. Um, but because we were early adopters, we are more marketable now that everybody else is caught up to it. Podcasting is kind of, you, you're probably too young to remember this, but there was a time where blogging, oh, you've gotta have a blog. Everybody's got a blog, you gotta get a blog. I gotta find somebody to do a blog. I need a QR code. I'll pay you $2,000 to give me a QR code. It's the new hot thing. Podcasting is sort of that thing where every company right now wants to, uh, wants to do a podcast. Now the benefit for you is that because you're young, people inherently think you know about technology. So if you actually do know about technology, then it's easy for you to market yourself to people who want to do a podcast or shoot video or do or blog or do any kind of digital work. Um, as I get older, people start to think less and less that I understand technology. Uh, and so it is, it is definitely an inherent built-in advantage of being young because you're digital natives. Um, I'm 36, so I'm right at the beginning of that digital native era. And the people who are older than 40 typically aren't digital natives. They didn't grow up the way that we grew up with uh, that with, you know, I didn't grow up with social media, I was in college before Facebook came along, but I was an early adopter of it, and so because I used it and I understood it, it made me more attractive to employers. Uh, so that's kind of a little bit about my career. I want to talk about what it means to build a successful podcast, uh, because I want to give you more of the how to do this and how I've been able to build what I've I've, I've kind of thought about what were the successful elements of the shows that I've worked on. And the first and the first and most important thing that I say to people is it has to be around your passion. You have to be really passionate about what you're talking about. Because building a podcast is like starting a second job. I mean, it, it, I have people get into it six months and look at me and go, this is a lot of work. And I go, I know, because it's a lot of work. It's not something that you, you may start and sit down in front of a microphone and talk into it and upload it, but eventually at some point you fall in love with it and you want to do it in, um, 
a bigger way than you're doing it. And so you have, you have to put it, you have to be talking about something you're passionate about. I'm passionate about politics. I'm passionate about podcasting. I didn't have to do much prep because I could sit here and talk to you for about the next three hours because I'm so excited about this particular topic. And so I'm eager to learn about it and I'm eager to research and talk about the things that I talk about. And I like prepping for uh, podcasts around politics because that's what I love to read about. Um, a lot of people will start a podcast for other reasons. I want to be famous. I want to be rich. I want to make money. And I'm here to tell you that that is the wrong reason to do it because you will not be rich and you probably won't be famous. You, you could. <laughs> you could build it over time into something. Um, but that takes many years to build. It was five years before I was able to monetize We Are Libertarians, and really eight years into it, I'm just now starting to see good monetization out of it uh, through advertising. Um, you know, and so you have to really let your passion drag you along. Uh, the, the other thing is that you have to have other people involved, because one thing about We Are Libertarians is that Sometimes I'm too busy to read and research, and I'm not into politics, and I've been following this for 20 years, and like, how many more times can I hear the same thing? Like, I don't want to talk about this. Like, I'm not interested in that. Like, I couldn't have cared less about impeachment, to be honest with you. It's like, we already know the result as you get started, but there were other people who were really interested in the topic, and we could have a conversation about it. And so, the, the reality is you want it to be conversational because talking into a microphone, especially when you're new and getting started, it, that's a very hard thing to do. It's very hard to monologue a show. And a lot of times that's not very interesting for your listener. Uh, and so if they're able to hear other voices, uh, I am a huge advocate of something that's called media representation. People need to hear and see in the content themselves. So if you have a show, you should have, like, um, my co-host Harry is a black male. I have a young female on the show. Because they bring interesting viewpoints that I don't have. And so I want to make sure that if you listen to my show, you'll hear yourself represented. And I think it's easy when you start out to just have your friends on. And your friends usually look like you or think like you. And so you want to have diversity of thought if you're going to build a successful show. And I think it just really improves your life, to be fair. So media representation is really important. If you're going to build something that is broad and appeal, make sure that you broaden the amount of people that are on the show. And so I, at any time, have 10, 15 people that I can invite on the show. Like I know that some people are not interested in foreign policy, but they're interested in environmental issues. So I'll have the environmental issues person on and the, the political person or the foreign policy person will sit out. You know? And that, that translates not just to politics but to other areas. It depends on what your particular sector of interest is. There's always different shades within every movement or niche that you're talking about. Um, and so try to look at the entire spectrum and bring as many voices in as possible. And you will find that you really enjoy the friendships that come out of podcasting and friendships that you didn't expect. And once you inspire people to join in, uh, you know, this is, we just did a redesign of this logo and that was funded by our people. And most of the people that donated are co-hosts because they're invested in building this project with me. And it's a team effort. Just like Bob and Tom is a team effort. There's a team of people working there. And yeah, we get paid to work on the Bob and Tom show, but we genuinely are devoted to the idea of the Bob and Tom show because millions of people listen a week and get something out of it. They send us emails and say, I had cancer you got me through the worst time of my life. I'm in the hospital with my mother and we're laughing to the show together. My dad and I bond over the Bob and Tom show. It's like the one thing, right? So people through your content start to really connect with you. And the idea of connection and relevancy are incredibly important. It's the most important thing. 
if you speak into a microphone, somebody has to find it relevant to their experience, or at least present it in a way that they can connect with. And so you can have disagreements, which I encourage. I, I encourage creative conflict. That's part of what the Pat Down podcast is. I think you can tell I'm as white as it gets. I grew up in Plainfield, Indiana, 98% white town. My co-hosts, Ms. Pat and Dion, are black. Ms. Pat grew up in Atlanta, has a very um, crazy childhood. Like it's just, it's really wild. And she moved to Plainfield at 30, and that was the first time she'd ever been around white people. And so the conversation of Miss Pat and myself is trying to understand our different cultures. But within that, there's conflict that comes out of that. And that's what's interesting to people. That creative conflict of, I don't think impeachment's a big deal. Here's why it's a big deal. People want to hear that debate. But at the end, they want to hear that you're friends. They don't like when people are actually mad at each other, right? So Ms. Pat and I debated Medicare for all. I'm a libertarian, she wants Medicare for all. At the end, it got heated, but at the end, we're still friends. That is interesting to people. People want to hear their, the conversations that they have on a daily basis with each other. They want to hear that represented. So make it conversational, make it, make it relevant to the people that are listening. Um, and if you're going to have other people involved and it's your project, be a leader and be fair. Uh, I've made a lot of mistakes in how I've handled a lot of my co-hosts. Uh, I wasn't always fair in the beginning, uh, but now I really try to make sure that if you're involved, I want you to get something out of it. I want you to feel that you are that you have some ownership over it. I want to make sure that, you know, if we're working on this together, that you feel uh, connected to it too, because it's not mine, it's ours. And you know, that is uh, a really important thing, because sometimes people can turn tyrannical. It happens. Um, so uh, don't be afraid to make mistakes. I think the most important thing about all this, especially when you're young, is just start. And the reality is that when you start, you're going to be horrible. Like, you're going to be bad at hosting a podcast. You're going to be a terrible blogger. Like, there are some things that, like, I read from my 2007 blog, and I'm just like, what an idiot. Um, and you're going to have that. You're going to look back at your past self and go, that show was horrible. My voice sounded terrible. I didn't understand what I was talking about. That show had bad quality. But the important thing is to ship it. Don't wait for it to be perfect. Just start and add on. I've had four different logos. I've had eight different versions of a website. I've had five iterations of co-hosts. You will evolve the product as you go on. It's just about learning and optimizing as you go on and continuing to just move forward and learn from what you've done. But don't wait. The, the biggest mistake that people make is that they wait to do something. Uh, I wish I could go back to my 18-year-old self and go, you should work out now because it's going to really suck when you're 36 and you start. You should, you should, uh, you know, I wish that I, I would have had way more, I would have done more things, like, I look back now and go, man, my co-host Joe was totally right. I should have had more famous libertarians on in 2013. It would have helped us grow faster, but I was like, I don't want to bother them with this dinky little podcast. I don't want to take up their time. Now, working in the business full time, I understand those people have something to promote. And usually they want to talk about themselves. You know? And so don't be afraid to reach out to somebody. Like if you're if you're in a space and there's that one person that you really want to talk to, but you're just like, they're never gonna come on this dumb show. Ask. Now make sure that you're a good host. Quality's good, you're on time, you're professional, you're prepared, but once you hit that particular level, don't be afraid to ask. Take chances, take risks, especially when nobody's watching. My first year of We Were Libertarians, 72 people were listening an episode. I thought that was amazing that I got anybody listening to this stupid thing. I talked to a podcaster yesterday, and he goes, I'm really excited. 
had 1,800 downloads last year. To him, that is a big deal because he's going, I can't believe anybody. I'm, it's, it's the imposter syndrome. If you've never heard of the imposter syndrome, look it up. You're going to work in the creative arts. You're going to feel like a fraud every day. When they asked me to come and speak to you, I said, why would you ask me, <laughs> right? But you all saw this and went, I wanna hear what that guy has to say, right? So I shouldn't dishonor the choice that you're making because I don't feel worthy. And you're gonna feel that every day you work in any creative industry. If you're a radio person, a TV person, a writer, an artist of any kind, you're going to feel that you're not worthy of what you're producing and that nobody's gonna like it. But that's just not true. You have to not listen to that voice and continue to uh, do better. So don't wait for it to be perfect, just ship it. Um, uh, and with that comes being vulnerable. People have to hear the human experience. And any type of creative work you're doing, you have to tell a story. Storytelling is the fundamental way that the human brain learns. They want to hear their story represented in the story you're telling. And uh, in everything that I try to do, I try to put empathy first. I try to make sure that people, um, when, they, when I invite them to listen and they come into my home that I'm a gracious host and that I'm not insulting people, I can tell you that there's two ways to build a media outlet. There is the hard way, which is to be respectful of people, to educate them, to try and give them information, to try and treat everyone with respect, and that's a long, hard road. And then there is the, I'm gonna put other people down to build my thing. And that's, that's like a diet of candy. It's really easy to get people riled up because you have an enemy to rail against, be it another podcaster or a group of people. And that really helps you build what you're trying to do. And, and politics happens all the time on the left and the right and libertarians like libertarians are always trying to fight with me to get their own social proof up you just got to walk away from that I've done that and I can tell you that it's soul killing and that it alienates potential audience and the long hard road is trying to appeal to as many people as possible by doing the right thing and treating people the right way do that because at the end of the day, you're gonna look back and be more proud of your career because you did that as opposed to cheap heat, which is a wrestling term for coming out and I'm gonna, I'm gonna build cheap heat. Um, so create, you have to be, you have to have conflict, creative conflict, but it has to be done in the right way. Conflict is important, but don't let it be real conflict. Resist that urge to do that cheap and easy thing uh, because it will come if you're doing any kind of creative work or broadcasting. Um, be vulnerable and open. Let people see who you are so they trust you. Why do people listen to you or why do they buy ads from you if you're doing an ad support model? Because they trust you. Because they hear who you are. They can see who you are. But being vulnerable and being open means being comfortable it took four years of therapy for me to get to the point where I feel that I can be open and vulnerable with people. I had to work on myself. Um, and I, through that period, showed too many wounds and not my scars. Being vulnerable in public means showing your, your scars. People love a scar story, right? Scars are cool to look at, because that's healed. A wound is gross. <laughs> and in sharing content publicly, Share your scars because they have a good story that people can learn from. A wound is something that people don't want to see and they don't. I mean, how many of you have Facebook friends where you're just like, I cannot believe this person posted that? And it's the same thing in broadcasting and podcasting. Show your scars and not your wounds. Um, so now that you have something to say, you have your friends gathered together, you've kind of got the overarching philosophy of what you want to do, uh, you now, how do you do it, right? My advice is to start really cheap, okay? Nobody's going to be listening for probably the first year or two. Maybe some of your friends start cheap. Don't spend a bunch of money. The most seductive thing in podcasting is the equipment. And I have a storage unit full of stuff that I shouldn't have bought. Um, so what I recommend is there's a microphone called the Audio-Technica 2100. I think they just upgraded it. 
It's a hundred bucks. Use Zoom. Get on a Zoom call with each other, which is like a Skype type product, and use a free host like Anchor or SoundCloud to begin. Okay, just start. Now make sure whatever you start, you can export that content. You can do a th what's called a 301 redirect and take that content to another host that's more professional. But buy a hundred dollar microphone that sounds good and start. You know, it's it's easy to go. I need a three hundred and fifty dollar recorder and. I need to buy five microphones at $100 each, and I need to, like I have all that stuff, and that stuff's good because I know what I'm doing with it, but when you don't know what you're doing with stuff, don't spend a bunch of money on the tech, because that's the seductive part that people spend too much money on. Use Canva for a logo. Um, try to achieve a certain level of quality, and in, in the, uh, the presentation, and also the branding and the marketing, as cheaply as possible, okay? What I learned from Abdul and what I've tried to do is like, nobody should, in my mind, consider me a political commentator, but thousands of people do. And it starts with them going to my website and it looking clean and professional and smart and everything is built for ease so you can grab all this stuff and understand who we are and what we do. You know, we, that's a big part of it, is making sure that you look professional. And even though you don't feel that you're an expert or you're brand new, my friend Joe taught me this. He, he goes, uh, I really wanted to know, uh, gosh, what, but Bentley Farnsworth? Farnsworth Bentley? I forget, I forget what the, he, the musician was, but he was like, I really wanted to hear his album. And so I called the record label and I was a fan and they wouldn't tell me when this album was coming out. And so then he called back and pretended to be a Hollywood agent. I need to know exactly when that album is coming out. And the person on the phone went, uh, yes, I'll get, I'll get right on that. And he realized if I act like I'm somebody, they're gonna treat me like somebody. That's what Abdul taught me too. And, and you have to act like you're a professional and eventually you will just become a professional. Professionalism is incredibly important. If you have an appointment with somebody, you're on time. If you have an interview with somebody, they have the link a day before. They have an understanding of what you're gonna talk about. If you have uh, co-hosts, you're talking to them and being proactive in communication. Professionalism is absolutely the number one reason why you will make it in this business. I am dependable, I am consistent, and I am professional, and I don't embarrass my employers, and I don't embarrass the people that are on my projects, because I take it seriously. And I take seriously the audience that pays attention to me. I make a promise to my audience and I deliver every single time. The worst thing you can do is accept the trust that someone gives you in giving you an hour of their life a week and then breaking that promise to them. Uh, I think that's just like, if you make a promise to your audience, to your co-host, to your employer, keep that promise. And people will eventually go, that guy's consistent, that gal is consistent. Um, so professionalism is just really important. Uh, if and when you're ready to move up, uh, I recommend Fireside. I really like Fireside as a product. This is the website that it builds it for you. It's 20 bucks a month. It gives you um, all kinds of great tools. It's cheap and easy, it's very easy to use. You're going to upload an episode. You can do all kinds of easy things with it. I really like Fireside as a podcast host. It's a great beginning platform. Um, to Once you start to build an audience, I recommend Patreon, which is uh, a great way. Uh, so before I start and give some time for Q and A, um, here are the biggest game changers that I found in building our product uh, at We Are Libertarians and in other places. Uh, we started with good equipment that sounded good, right? Like if you listen, it didn't sound like we were talking in a tin can. At the time when we started, a lot of people were using Blog Talk Radio, which was literally a telephone conference software. Like you're not gonna build, nobody wants to listen to that, right? When I started, there wasn't a Gimlet, there wasn't a Wondery, there wasn't 
you know, the professionalism that you hear in the storytelling podcast. Like, This American Life was out, but no, all the other podcasts sounded horrible. So what made me different? I sounded good, right? So it's always trying to find out what is the competition doing and how can I get an edge over that and build something else onto that. The second was building a website looking professional. Getting a, a, a good logo designed, building a website, and the SEO that came with having a website. Like if you Google Libertarian Podcasts, you're gonna find my website and another website I built, and guess who's first on the podcast you should listen to? We are Libertarians, right? So it's, again, trying to find that edge, because how do people find podcasts? You go to the directory and you search for a term, or you go to Google and you search for a term. So trying to think about your user behavior and building tools that allow them to find you easily and understand what you're doing and why you're worth their time easily, your description the first paragraph on your website. All that should be very clear and easy to understand. Um, we got a logo done, that was a big part of it. Starting a Patreon was huge for us. Once I asked people to invest money into <coughs> the project, people felt an ownership over it. And again, it wasn't commoditized, it was me having the attitude and telling my audience, I'm not here to take your money because I wanna get rich. We're building something together. Because that's how I view it. It's not good marketing. I genuinely take the money that people give and I put it towards growing another piece of the podcast platform. And so once people started investing in what we're doing, they felt ownership. They're the ones sharing content. They're the ones that I talk to. I, I send, and I just try to find ways to show appreciation to that. I just ordered some magnets. I'm gonna handwrite a thank you and send that magnet to each and every one of our patrons. That's going to cost me two, three hundred dollars, but it it gets people thinking about what you're doing. And, and I wrote, hand wrote Christmas cards, and the response to that was great. Um, direct mail for an audio product is really important. Like at Bob and Tom at We're Libertarians, I use direct mail a lot because you never get good mail. But it, and if you get mail from something that's a digital product, they go, "Well, this is weird." Um, Calling out for volunteers is the same mindset. Like, we have a research team. So if I can't really focus in on a subject, we have 16 pages of show notes. Like, if you give me an hour and a half of your time, I'm gonna give you all of the information about a subject. I'm gonna explain to you what is coronavirus, what are people saying about it, what is the left and the right saying about it, what do I think about it, and let you draw your own conclusions. No, by the way, here's all of our work, right? So. Why do people not trust political broadcast outlets? Because they think it's hot air. All right, well, I'm gonna do the opposite of what you think, and I'm gonna show you all my work, and you can fact check me, which has built kind of an annoying audience because I can't say anything without getting corrected, but I love it because it creates independent thinkers. Uh, the next game changer was newsjacking. The title of your podcast is super important. That, like, it can vary thousands of downloads based on the topic that you're talking about. And so a couple years ago I said, all right, if the title matters that much, I'm gonna start talking about what people are talking about. And that has just been fantastic for us. So instead of me talking about what I think you ought to know or what I think you should hear me talk about because it's about me, I started to go, okay, what do they want? What would interest you? What will get you talking? What, will, what do you want to understand? And that has totally changed things. Again, it's thinking about others and thinking about your audience and trying to do good stuff for them. Um, and the next one was the total rebranding. We now, like I said, have multiple podcasts, we have a magazine, we have an email newsletter, uh, and it was really important. We just launched all that branding this past weekend. It was me sitting at my laptop for about 15 hours total this past weekend, manipulating that same logo 50 different times in 50 different places. Uh, to get it looking right, but in an election year, more of you guys are paying attention to politics, and so when you go search Libertarian in your podcast directory, we look the best. That cover art looks great. Everybody else looks scary, right? So, all right, these guys have been around since 2012, and these guys kind of look really scary, so I'm gonna go with them, right? So it's just about, again, creating a welcoming environment for as many people as possible. Um, so with that, I just want to say, just start something. It's really beneficial. You'll get a lot out of it. If it goes nowhere, 
fine. You made a lot of friendships, you learned some skills that will translate to your future employer, and you'll have a lot of fun doing it. So uh, we've got about seven minutes left, so I'd like to take any questions that you guys might have. I will start calling on people. Yes, sir, what's your name? So how do you, uh, Wyatt Williams. Hi. So uh, how do you recommend people like in the, at the high school level develop an audience um, through like marketing and stuff for their podcast? Marketing, and I didn't say this, but marketing and media are now merged. And so marketing is really important. And so if you're in a high school environment, you have to think about what would get a high school audience listening to your podcast. Well, what tools do you have available to you and it's, everything I do is at an intersection of multiple things. There's always different shareholders in the conversation, or there's different tools, or there's budgetary constraints. Like, yeah, I'd love for us to have, you know, a, a, a big studio like Joe Rogan for our podcast, but I can't afford it, right? So I have to find the tools to market that. In a high school environment, what, what do you have at your disposal? A captive audience in a building that they have to show up to every day. Well, flyers. I would do a printed flyer. It doesn't even have to be very expensive. You just have to hit the percentage of people that will see the existence of something and go, I want to listen to that, watch that, read that, right? So you're, if you put out 10,000 flyers or 1,000 flyers and only 5% of the people that will see that flyer are going to take an action, you want to increase the amount, right? So, like. It's just about raising awareness. The number one growth factor of anything is word of mouth. You've gotta get people talking about it. It's the concept of social proof. It, it's why I have a network of people. We're not financially tangled, but if I talk about myself, you guys go, Ugh. If I can get all of you to talk about me, then that row goes, that guy must be somebody. That podcast must be something. That blog must be worth reading, right? So you've got to get other people talking about it. So I think, how do you do that um, in a captive place like that? Flyers would be good, you know, or even setting up some sort of club. Let's say you have whatever your interest is. Let's say, um, you know, you want to do a podcast about chess. Start a chess club, because then all of a sudden the school's helping you promote the chess club. You get people there, and then, oh, by the way, listen to my podcast. So you're doing several things. You're building a community of people. People are, you have not learned this yet, but the adults in the room will agree with me. People are more lonely today than ever before, and they want to feel like they belong to something. And so take your niche and build a community. Go to our website. You can start a, a, what's called Liberty and Chill, which is just a weekly gathering with local politically interested people because it's important to create community. So flyers and create a community around what you're doing. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Buying, purchasing, video equipment. I spent way too much money on video equipment. Uh, you're either an audio podcast or you're a video product. You're not both. And, and it takes a tremendous amount of money to do video right. We spend a tremendous amount of money at Bob and Tom to have our eight camera shoot, our nightly TV show on YouTube and Facebook. It takes two staffers and a ton of equipment that costs a lot of money, right? So what we've started to do is we buy Logitech 920s for 60 bucks and we use Zoom and we put that up on YouTube and people are just as happy with that as when I spent too much money on computers and specific cameras and lightning connectors trying to get like a multi-camera shoe. Uh, I, I just think that video, the behavior for video is that people listen to it and if something happens they go and check it out. Like, you turn on Joe Rogan on your TV and you clean your house while you're listening to it and if something happens, you look at it, right? So I, I focus on audio specifically and then offer video as just a, I'm trying to catch you on YouTube when you search coronavirus, you know, or if your work firewall only allows YouTube, then you can hear the podcast on YouTube. Um, 
I, I spent too much on video and it's, it, it's not worth it. You're better off using a Logitech 920 and using OBS and creating a good video product that way and learning that tool. Anybody else? We got two minutes. Just awkwardly stare at each other. I'm okay with it. How about anybody who has a podcast? Yes, sir. What are some of the advantages you find with a long term, or sorry, a long format podcast bringing you anywhere in an hour opposed to uh, more short term podcasts bringing you anywhere? Yeah, so I find that, so some of our early episodes are like three hours. Like, I mean, the number one podcast in the world is Joe Rogan. He's making $30 million, he's getting $25,000 in ad read, and his podcasts are two to three hours. You all know who I'm talking about when I say Joe Rogan. People are not afraid, early on, and some people will say, oh, you gotta have a 20 minute podcast. Uh, because the average drive in a car is 20 minutes, 17 minutes to be exact. Uh, I've, we do our long form 90 minute show with some stop points and some chapter markers at around 30 minutes. So people can dive right back into that and find it easily. But we also do little 20 minute shows. Uh, I think there's something to be said for doing a shorter show because it, a lot, it forces us to be more concise and get to the content quicker. But people like a long form show because they want to hear the flow of conversation. They don't want to be interrupted. Like if you listen to our show, one of the differentiators is that it's a conversational show with a bunch of people that you can relate to versus a magazine that is doing a political show and it's a bunch of nerds trying to fit all this information into 20 minutes. Like, I'm a nerd, so I can say that, but um, I just think that you shouldn't force yourself, you should be cognizant. We stick to 90 minutes because three hours is too much. It, it puts too much fluff in that people don't want to hear. They want what's relevant. And that first 20 minutes is us, uh, what I call the uh, personality building section, you know? So that first 20 minutes is us chit chatting so you get to know who you're listening to. And then the other portion of the show is the information that you want. And I put a marker on there so people can just skip the fluff if they don't want it. But I, I think if you do a three hour show, then you're adding in too much that people don't want to hear. People want you to get to the thing that they want to learn about or that they want to hear. But if you have like a conversational show, like a Joe Rogan show, you don't know what you're going to hear, right? You, you tune in and you're kind of like, I just want to hear where the conversation takes them because this is an interesting person that I want to hear. So it's about experimenting and finding what works for your audience, which is why you have to constantly ask your audience, engage their reaction, and do surveys, because to do kind of the kind of content that people want, you gotta understand who you're talking to. But, final thing on that is, the majority of my audience are white males, millennials, middle class, Christians, right? So birds of a feather flock together, so you kind of draw in who want, which is a great opportunity to, to, to use diversity to expand some of that horizon. So, um, but constantly test your audience, surveys, understand who you're talking to. So uh, feel free to follow me on anything. Look up Chris Spangle, you'll find me or the dancer in Denver, but you'd probably figure out that I'm not the dancer in Denver. So feel free to follow me. If you guys have questions after this, feel free to message me on whatever platform, Instagram or Twitter or Facebook, and I'll be happy to answer your questions. So thank you guys so much for listening.